This channel is brought to you by the family of Bill Britton. Written material may be ordered at BillBrittonMinistries.com. All of Bill Britton's messages are sent out for an offering of any size. This is a faith ministry made possible by the members of the body of Christ. We give God all the glory and pray He blesses this message wherever it goes. Praise the Lord. Turn with me to the first chapter of the book of Revelation. And uh, I want to finish the first chapter of Revelation this morning, the Lord willing, and um, be ready to get into chapter 2 and 3, which are the seven churches. But there are just a few points here that we have not covered yet, and I don't think it'll take too long to get these few points if we don't stay very long on them. In uh, verse 12, praise the Lord. It's taken us six or seven sermons to get to verse 12. But we're going to finish the verse 12 through verse 20. I keep saying that so I hear it. Not so you hear it, but so I can hear it. Amen. In verse 12, John said, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. Now, previous to this, John was saying down in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a voice as a trumpet. And it was saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Now, I want to submit to you that sometimes you can be in the Spirit, right where God wants you, and still not be facing in quite the right direction. You can be at the place God wants you. You can be in the Spirit and still not be hearing or be able to see until you are turned to see in the direction God wants you to go. There are many ministries today that are spiritual ministries. I recognize that. Yet they are not quite turned in the right direction. They're not seeing what God is doing for in this hour. We cannot disfellowship them for such a thing, though they speak different things than we speak, so they're seeing something different, what we're seeing. Sometimes we are, are being disfellowship for seeing something different from what other ministries see. But I believe we're hearing the same voice. But even John here, when he began to hear the voice, he recognized he had to make a turn. And he turned to see the voice. And that's a strange statement. I would have said, I turned to see the one who was, had the voice or was doing the speaking. But he turned to see the voice. Now, if you're standing behind me and speaking, and I turn, I still can't see your voice. I can see where it came from, but I can't see the voice. But the Scripture says he turned to see the voice. And I want to tell you this morning that who that voice is, the voice of the Lord. And when he turned to see the voice, what did he see? He said, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Amen. That's the first thing he saw because he turned to see the voice. And who was that voice? It was the candlesticks. And I think you're aware that the candlestick is representative of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The voice of the Lord. The voice of many waters. The sound of the Lord in the earth. Did you know that Rare has been the occasion, if ever, I've never heard the voice of God speaking out of the heavens with a thundering sound of his voice giving me instructions to do so and so. Sometimes I hear a still small voice inside of me, the Lord speaking to my heart, but I've never heard a voice. When I hear the voice of God, you know where it comes from? It comes from the ministries of God. It comes from those who are speaking at the mouth of the Lord. Hallelujah. You are the voice of God. You are living epistles. 
written and read of all men. You are the sound of God in the earth. The world has no other sound of God. They've made up their own gods. In Zaire, in other places around the world, they have their gods. In America, they have their gods of gold and silver and of other things that they worship. I recently dealt with a young man away from God who had uh, been presenter of the gospel. That is, he had submitted himself. He had claimed to be a Christian, but had gone totally alcoholic. I said to him, now I'm not going to preach to you. You know the word. You have made your choice. The choice of what the God you serve, whether you serve the God of creation, of salvation, of heaven, or the God of booze, nicotine, and hell, that's your choice. And the men and women in the world today are making a choice today of which God they're serving. But the real God, the God of creation, is making a sound in the earth, and that sound comes through his church. Hallelujah. I turned to see the voice, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, I want to point out to you, the number seven, I won't go into detail on this, but the number seven speaks of maturity and perfection. It's a number of spiritual perfection. And this candlestick that we're seeing at the point in time that John is seeing this candlestick, it is spiritually perfected. Seven golden candlesticks. Well, in the Old Testament, the candlestick was made out of pure gold. The point that it brings out here, and the fact that it brings this out, is showing us that this is the candlestick of which Moses was a type of. Not only that, but this candlestick is the golden candlestick, and that speaks of the deity and nature of God. Hallelujah. The candlestick, it was perfected. And it had the nature of deity. Now that's something we hardly are able to conceive. It's hard, something that we hardly are able to, uh, to understand or receive. The fact that the church has got to be golden. Hallelujah. Thank you for shouting. Candlesticks. Seven of them. All right. This was a church. And the fact that there were seven not only speaks to me of the spiritual perfection, but it tells me that this was a plurality and yet a oneness. Now that's kind of strange. It can be plural and one at the same time. But it's a mystery of God. A plurality. Churches. Local. All over the world. Yet there are one church. A plurality that is one. And if we don't recognize that, that we are one with the body of Christ, not just those that believe exactly like us, but with those who are baptized by the Spirit in the one body. Amen. Now notice the next thing. In the midst of the seven candlesticks stood one, like unto the Son of Man. Praise the Lord. He begins to see a picture of the Lord here. He begins to see in symbolism. Now, I hope you understand that this is not a physical, natural, carnal thing that he's presenting to us, but all these things that he was seeing by the Spirit here as he was in the Spirit are symbols of something. Hallelujah. The candlestick means nothing to us unless it is symbolic of something in our lives today. And he is in the candlesticks, in the midst of the candlesticks. What does that say? It tells me he's in the church. You want to find Christ? find him in his people. He's not out on a mountain somewhere. He's not going to be out on Mount of Olives or uh, Mount Everest or the highest place in the world or someplace else. He's going to be in his church. That's where you find him. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, he has a garment. He said he's clothed with a garment down to the feet. Praise the Lord. I like that. Glory to God. Now, the kind of garment he's clothed with is the garment of glory. 
I don't think that it was some tailor that had got in Jerusalem or something to fix him up a suit of clothes. Wasn't any tailors on Patmos. I don't think they had any tailors as such in heaven. But he was clothed with glory and it went all the way down to where? His feet. Now, some of you may be aware, and if you're not, please get a hold of the book on how beautiful are the feet. They are free. They're here. We'll give them to you. And explain to you about this feet company. Many of these things that are here in the Revelation and uh, these principles we have already written about. And um, you that read them are already uh, with me on that. If you have not read them, I would encourage you to read them. Not because they're my books, but because uh, they enlighten on some of the things we're saying. All right. The feet company, clothed with glory. And I submit to you that one thing that is unique about the feet of the Lord, those that are on the earth, the feet company is that part of the body of Christ that is in contact with the earth. Now, in case you haven't heard me say this before, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year. It describes the garments that he wears when he goes in. From his phylactery uh, to the border around his garments, the bells, the pomegranates, his girdle, everything is described, but no gloves and no shoes. No description of shoes. Why? Aren't they important? There weren't any. He went in barefoot. There wasn't any pavement in the Holy of Holies. They didn't have any rugs in the Holy of Holies. Your feet right on that old desert sand in the wilderness during the 40 years of wandering. And when they got over in the promised land, when they planted that Ark of the Covenant, whatever it was, on grass or sand, when you walked in the holy place, you were on terra firma. And that's the way God wants it. He wants a people on terra firma in the Holy of Holies. We've been taught, oh, suffer it out here, and someday we'll all go to heaven. Yeah, well, that's true. Someday we'll all go to heaven, but something's going to happen before then. While on terra firma, the feet company are going to go through the veil and are be clothed with glory. The Shekinah glory of God, if you please. Hallelujah. So he is clothed with a garment down to the feet. The paps. All right, where does that say that here? And a girt about the paps with a golden, gir golden girdle. And uh, somebody said, where's the paps? Well, um, in the book of Luke, if I can think of it, find it real quick uh, here. No, I, just, uh, I won't look it up right now, but Jesus said to the women one time, Blessed, no, the women said to Jesus, Blessed is your mother. Blessed are the paps that gave you suck. Now you can discern from that that this is talking about the breast. And this one here was girded about across his breast with a girdle, golden girdle. Wasn't down on his stomach, is up across his chest. Why? That's where your heart is. And where, what does a girdle speak of? We're girded about in Ephesians 6, with what? The, gold, the girdle of truth. All right? Gird about with the girdle of truth. Now, this girdle that he sees here is about his chest, in his breast area, right over his heart. Why? Because this one that he's seeing is, uh, has truth in his heart. Now, I want to emphasize that because a lot of people have truth in their head, but it never gets into their heart. And our heart represents, and we know that this heart is not the actual uh, seat of our emotions as such, because there are people going around with mechanical hearts. One I, I, I hear about all the time, that's, every time I turn on the news, I'm hearing about a fellow with a mechanical heart. He didn't have any, they've taken that, put it in a metal in there. Okay, and we got a doctor in a, uh, coming up doctor here in the uh, um, audience this morning, and he can tell us more about that than I can tell you. But 
I want to tell you that the heart is representative, symbolic of the very deepest emotions that we have. The thing that rules our being. The reins are the guiding of our very lives is symbolized by heart. And the fact that this girdle of truth is about his heart speaks about that his life is directed and the life of this church in which he is in the midst of here is directed by truth. Now, the reason I'm hitting that a little hard this morning is because one of the big problems that I have with people today, particularly not only young people, but particularly the young people, because they've grown up in a culture, in a generation where they've been presented with other principles. But I've had trouble with young people who, whose lives are girded with truth. That is, that their lives are directed by right principles. They judge everything by whether it's an advantage to me or whether it's a disadvantage. Um, um, hallelujah. Um, situation morals, I think. Is that what situation ethics? Situational ethics. It, the situation will depend on what your ethics are. Not so. The situation and the way you respond to a situation will depend upon whether you're girded with a golden girdle over your heart. Hallelujah. Now, it's a golden girdle. A golden girdle. That means this is the truth of God. This is the very nature of God. And you respond to every situation according to how the nature of Jesus Christ would respond to that. And uh, I've told many times in personal counseling, people uh, would come with a problem or somebody's attacked him or something's happening to them. They're going through tribulation. I say, well, the only thing I can tell you on this is you respond to those things as if Jesus Christ was wearing your shoes. How you figure, how would he respond to this? What would he say to that? Would he respond to them with the curses and attacks and, and, and hit them with something? No, then you cannot do that. Respond as though it were Jesus. Golden girdle. Now, we come to the head. His head and his hairs were white like wool. And I labored over that. And uh, throughout the scripture, we find that white is symbolic of the purity, sinlessness. And I mean talk about pure white. The kind of white that Nancy's got on her blouse there, not the kind of white that our faces are. We're not, we're pink, light brown or something. But I'm talking about pure white in the sight of God. And I think of in um, Isaiah 1 and 18, where it says, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Hallelujah. Now, here it says that his head and his hair was white as wool, as white as snow. And I see this one here who is showing us what the Son of Man is like. His head is covered with a purity. There is a cleanness in his mind. There is a purity, a sinlessness there. And beloved, I don't know if anybody has ever made it yet or not. I haven't run into them. But we have got to come to the place whether we have clean minds, pure minds, sinless minds, as pure as snow. I knew a man, I know a man who once lived here who had that kind of a mind. He could talk to harlots. They didn't entice him. He could talk to women who had been married five times. They didn't attract him, but he attracted them to a life of purity, of holiness. Neither do I condemn thee. Not because he had not right. He was the only one there under his conditions that had the right to cast a stone. He that is without sin among you, cast the first stone. He was the only one that could do it. But he said, no, I won't do it. But go and sin no more. I want to tell you, a man who was pure and clean in mind will not go using that to condemn other people who are not as good as he is. 
Not go around saying, well, when you get to the place where I am, then you won't do all these things. No, that's not the, the way Jesus was. He was a man whose head and hair was white as wool. Now, on the radio program the other day, in the, one of the questions was, what's it going to be like in the millennium? What kind of bodies will we have? Well, we've dealt with that in one of the books quite in some, uh, a little bit, to some extent. But um, will we still brush our teeth? Well, one of the callers want to know. Yeah, I'd like to know what kind of bodies will we have? Or he responded, actually, to that. And uh, um, his response was, well, you look in Revelation chapter 1, you see what he was. And that's what we're going to be. Well, symbolically, yes. But if you're expecting to have white hair in the tribulation, in the physical, you got a surprise. Praise the Lord. As far as our natural bodies, and this is what I was dealing with on the radio, was our natural bodies. But the man in the spirit, see, this is what God is revealing here, is that man in the spirit. What you're like in the spirit. Hallelujah. A body? Yes, we'll have a body. It'll be a redeemed body. It'll be a body that'll be capable of uh, riding in an automobile, taking a flight in an airplane, having lunch with your friends, putting on a business suit, and, uh, or putting on a sport, uh, sport shirt and going to uh, play a game somewhere. It'll be that kind of a body, but the spirit that's in that body will be what we're seeing right here without sin in the mind. A clean and a pure mind. The head. Pure. The eyes. Now listen, he said his eyes were a flame of fire. A flame of fire. I tell you, this would be a strange thing to try to draw a picture of. A physical body that looked like this is described here. Wouldn't be maybe quite as difficult as drawing that four creatures in Ezekiel chapter 1. But it would be a little bit difficult to draw a picture of this. But he is... Eyes were as a flame of fire. Now, uh, fire does several things. It brings light. And it purifies. It destroys. Hallelujah. Vision. The eyes speak to us of the vision. And uh, I see this one who has a vision like a flame of fire. It's pure. It destroys the dross and the sin. It destroys the... Uh, a, a pure vision destroys the false teachings. It destroys the error. And I have discovered a long time ago that the best way to deal error with error is to preach the truth. And you don't find me very often in my papers or from this pulpit attacking false doctrines. But I might take that false doctrine or what it teaches and teach the truth. That's a counterpart of it or the, the opposite of it. Because truth will destroy error. Light will destroy darkness. This eyes, this vision is a flame of fire will destroy error and bring light and purify our vision. Praise the Lord. All right, I can say a lot about that. Let me go on. I've got to hurry. Our time's about gone. All right. His feet. Oh, glory to God. Now we're back with the feet. Are you here, feet? All the feet that are here say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. And what does it say? His feet like unto fine brass. Now, brass in the Bible is type of judgment. The brazen altar in Moses' tabernacle, in the outer court, was a place where the sin offering was brought. The burnt offering was burnt there on that altar because it dealt with sin. It dealt with the judgment. When that altar was built, it was made first of wood. And wood it speaks of the human nature, humanity. Then they covered that wood over with brass. Now, I don't want to preach this whole thing. I've got a book on that, <laughs> as usual. But uh, I got, uh, <laughs> but he covered it with brass, overlaid it with brass. 
And what does it say? It says that that human man in the garden, because of sin, he was covered with brass. Or judgment came upon him greater than human nature. There's no part of the human nature didn't come under judgment. His body, his soul, everything about him came under the judgment because of the sin. But something else came on top of that brass. They put something else on top of the brass that was blood. They took the blood of the offering of the lamb, the ram, and they sprinkled it on the horns of the altar and against the sides of the altar and poured some out on the ground. Now that speaks very strongly to me about the sacrifices Jesus made, his death on the cross, the price that he paid. The horns of the altar in the Bible speaks of strength, power. One time they said a prophet took some horns and he put them up here and he said, with these, like these horns, you're going to push the enemy back. Horn speaks of overcoming, of a, a power. And the fact that there were horns on these altars speaks, first of all, of the power of the wood, because they were made, the horns were made out of wood. The power of that human man in the garden. The power of humanity today. The power of our psychic realm is greater than what most any of us even conceive or understand. But the power of the judgments come upon us is greater than any man can deal with himself. But greater than that is the power of the blood. Amen. The power of that blood was put upon the horns of the altar. And then it was slapped against the side of the altar, and some poured out from the ground. I said, Lord, what'd you waste that for? That's not wasted. Creation's going to be redeemed because of the redemption of mankind that's under judgment. All right, feet like unto brass. Did you know that this son of man, this representative here, this picture we have of the body of Christ has been brass, feet like brass, the feet company. Amen. All right, but it goes on to say, they were like fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. Hallelujah. Are you uh, in a furnace? You feel like sometimes God's got the heat on you? What's he doing? Going to burn you up, destroy you? No. Brass is not uh, ignitable. What is it? Uh, what? Combustible. It's not, it doesn't burn. You, the fire cleanses it and shapes it. But it doesn't burn it up, destroy it. Wood, hay, and stubble is that what's going to be burned up. But the brass is shined and polished after it's been through the furnace. Hallelujah. Victory through the fire. The Hebrew children found this out, didn't they? In the furnace when they threw them in. Out of that fire came forth three victorious, overcoming sons of God that stood up then and were given place of authority in the kingdom because they had gone through the fire victoriously. Amen. And we keep saying the church is going to go through that fire victoriously. Well, don't be surprised when it begins to happen. A little bit of flames light around our feet and we go berserk. We, we just about uh, panic. Say, oh, call the pastor, call the preacher, call somebody, tell them to get on the ball, stop this thing, get this fire put out. Oh, no, Brother Brass, feet company, you got to go through a furnace. Hallelujah. All right, but it's victory through it. And then it says his voice as the sound of many waters. Hallelujah. Who are these waters? Well, the waters in the Bible speaks of the people, the seas. The seas and the ocean that are constantly moving is like the unconverted multitudes. But here we find there's a river of water. There's many waters. And his voice is a sound of many waters. Ezekiel speaks of this too. And uh, we've spoke on that, read on that later, uh, before, so we won't deal with it now. But this voice is a sound of many waters. He's a church. This is another confirmation here that what he's seeing, he's seeing the body of Christ. He's seeing the Son of Man in his body in the midst of the candlesticks. Hallelujah. Sons of God. 
seven stars in his right hand. He had in his right hand, verse 16, seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shines in his strength. Now, these stars that he had in his right hand weren't little Christmas stars, by the way. You know, you've seen the little stars about so large. You, but that wasn't the kind of stars they were. He had a symbolic thing in his hand, and they were like stars. Now, the Jewish stars, six-pointed. Uh, our stars are five-pointed, you know, and we have a lot of things like points and all that. But he doesn't refer to these as just toys. These are symbols of something in his hand, and his, uh, out of his mouth is a sharp two-edged sword. Now, this is a strange-looking fellow. His eyes a flame of fire, his feet polished brass, and out of his mouth goes a big sword. That scared him by death, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it scared John. He fell at his feet as dead. See? But this thing they were seeing going out of his mouth, the sharp two-edged sword, is the Word of God. Hebrews 4 and 12 said the Word of God is a sharp two-edged sword, dividing asunder spirit and soul. A sharp two-edged sword. And this mouth, out of this mouth, goes forth the word of God. And beloved, that's what the voice is for, is to speak the word of God. We speak fables sometimes. We speak traditions. We speak complaints. We speak uh, attacks, personal attacks on people. We do, but what is our voice is designed for is for the Word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And as you use that Word, it will bring forth some great results in your life. I'm trying to think. I get a lot of mail. And uh, I don't get to read it all, but I read most of it. A lot of anything important. But so one letter came in, and they said... Um, uh, yes. And by the way, we can speak with our pen, too, you know. You're right. That's, that's, those are words. Well, this letter, one letter came in and said that uh, they'd been blessed. They'd, here at the convention, I think, they'd uh, given something and it came back to them. But this letter, I'm trying to think of get it together now so I don't mix it up with another letter. And that was this lady written to me, and she'd uh, asked for prayer. She said, I'm going through a, a financial real financial problem right now and uh, would you pray and so forth so Nancy wrote the letter and had a bill add note on it see that means that I put a personal note underneath the letter PS and when I read her letter and I, I the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and I wrote a PS I said in a, in an essence what I said was in the name of the Lord I release the finance for your need to be met in Jesus' name. Put it on there. Remember that one? Well, I got a letter back from her last few days. And um, she said she was rather startled, happy that here the one she's writing to had written back in his own handwriting. Wasn't one of those form letters that you get from big evangelists, you know. But uh, had written his own handwriting and had put a blessing on her. And within a few days, $500, did you mention the amount or do you know? $500 came in and met her need. And it was quite a confirmation, quite a witness to her. But what was it? It was the word of the Lord. I didn't write just out of my own heart, but I've, what I said in that particular case, and I didn't know just what, how it would take a turn, I mean, how it would result or whatever. I didn't know how God would do it. But I felt led of the Lord to put those words down, and there was a word of the Lord. And it brought results. And that's what God is after. For His voice, and you are His voice, you know, to be a sharp, two-edged sword coming out of His mouth. All right. Praise the Lord. Okay. Now, in His hand, seven stars in His right hand. Now, the hand, the right hand, and I always wonder why it says right hand or left hand. It usually says right hand about a certain things. Because the right hand in the Bible, and apologies to the left-handed people, but the right hand in the Bible speaks of 
the hand of authority, the hand of power, the hand of the inheritance. When Joseph was going to put his hands on the two sons, or Jacob on the two sons of Joseph and bless them, uh, Joseph put the oldest son where the right hand would get on him, and Jacob crossed his hand. Oh, he said, no, Father, this one's oldest. Put your right hand on him. What difference does it make? It made a difference to them back there because the right hand always stood for the authority, the heaviest part of the blessing and all that. So out, this one who's standing there, his, he, in his right hand he had these seven stars. This speaks of the inheritance. Amen. All right, seven stars. Seven speaks of being matured and perfected. And these stars are the ministries. Amen. Daniel speaks about those that when many to uh, the Lord will uh, shine as the stars forever. And then in uh, uh, the book of Psalms, it says, I know the stars, I call him by my name, or he calls the stars by, by their name, and so forth. And these stars speaks of ministries. They're lights in the heavens. Hallelujah. And he has them in his hand. And if you're a light in the heaven and he hasn't got you in his hand, you know what you are? You're a, uh, what they call a falling star? Zooming through that. Did you ever see a falling star? Well, these lights, little comets is really what they are. We call them stars when I was a kid. But they shoot through the night, you know, and you say, oh, look, that makes a lot more light than some of these other stars. But it's just a temporary thing. It's going to burn itself out. Why? Because it's not in orbit. Now, when a star is in orbit, it will stay in its place where he has set it, and you can set your clock by it. Do you know what time it is? I know what time it is. I'm 10 minutes past time. Okay? I'm watching. I'm watching. And I'm almost halfway through. <laughs> but let me tell you, when a star's in orbit, where it's supposed to be, the observatory, the naval observatory, sets their clocks by it. The radios get their time from that. We get our time from the radio, and we set our clocks by the stars. But when a star is on its own, it's not in his hand, and it's flying through the heavens, making a bright, burning, uh, zooming uh, light, it burns itself out. And you can't set your, uh, your time by that. You can't tell what time of the year it is. You can't tell what time of... Uh, of the spiritual calendar it is by those shooting stars. Shooting stars is what I was trying to think of all instead of falling stars. Shooting stars, we call them. Praise the Lord. All right. Ministries perfected in his hand. His countenance was the brightness of a sun shining in his power. Now, this was not the physical appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a symbolic spiritual appearance to show us certain things about him. I saw him and I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand on me. There was power imparted to him. That's when he laid his right hand on John, power. There was an impartation there to him. And then he said, fear not. I like that. And all the things that he shows us in various places, some of the dreadful things that have come on the earth, one thing that keeps leaping through the pages of God's book and out of his mouth, he says, fear not. Fear not. They cannot hurt you. They cannot touch you. Oh, you say the kill stones over here. Brother, he's in glory. See? They did not hurt him. He received blessings for every bit of suffering that he went through. God's ordained it. God's come. Uh, God has uh, programmed it like that. All right. Hallelujah. Now, he is first. He said, I'm the first, I'm the last. I'm alive. Let me read that. 17, I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and laid his hand, right hand upon me, say, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first, and I am the last. Now, we're not going to go into detail here, but there's a lot can be said, and maybe said later. We're going to run into this term later on in Revelation. We'll stop and deal with it sometime along the way. He's the first. Nothing started before him. I mean, he's... He's a source of everything that's here on earth. What you see and what you don't see, he's a source of it. And not only that, but he's the last. It's all going to wind up back in him. Hallelujah. Now, I am he that liveth and was dead. This is not the Father speaking here. 
Father never died. Our Heavenly Father never, he couldn't die. There's no death in him. This is the man Jesus, the man of Galilee, and he's the one that's talking here. So when we're reading this portion, he identifies us, I am he that liveth and was dead. Now he didn't just pass out in a coma. He was dead. So, and he says, I'm alive forevermore. Forevermore. Not just age lasting, eternally alive forevermore. And he has the keys of hell and death. All right, now I want to close right here. I don't want to get started on that, but I'm going to close right here, and that is the last word he says. Right. Verse 19. Right. I like that. You know why I like it. Hallelujah. Was well, I right? But he says to John here on Patmos, he said, write. Now notice what he told him to write. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which there be hereafter. Write the things you have seen, that's past. That's yesterday. That's history. Write the things which are, that's today. That's exploits. That's what's going on right now. Write these things that happen. Well, is anything happening worth writing about? There should be. In your life, there should be something happening that's worth writing about. Hallelujah. Something going on. If you're just a zombie, a robot, a dead thing waiting for something to happen, you're out of order. Something should be going on in your life right now. Praise God. I write. I have a bunch of kids I write to. I love the kids, and I write to kids all over the country, all over the world. I write to them in Ireland, various places. And uh, I start telling them, well, what's happening? Boy, I get sit down, and so many things are happening. What can I write about? But things in my life are really happening. I'm not just an old senior citizen sitting in a wheelchair or in a rocking chair waiting to die and go to heaven and get my rewards. Something is happening to me right now. But he said, write about it. Not only that, but things which shall be. The forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. History, exploits, and restoration. Write about the things that are coming. Write about the things that shall happen in the future. I want to tell you as I spoke here while back. This church that we're seeing here in the Bible and we should be a part of that church is a prophetic church. We're looking forward to something. We're not just looking back. To, well, thank God. He said, write about the things that have happened. Amen. What that happened? Jesus was born. Wonderful. We thank God for that. But we don't camp there. Things are happening today. But we don't get all taken up just what's happening today. We know something's going to happen in the future. Yesterday, today, and forever. And in 2 Corinthians 1 and 10, He delivered us. He does deliver. He will yet deliver. He has delivered us. He is delivering us. He will yet deliver us. Yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, we have been born again. We have been born again. We are in the Lord. We have, something's happened to us. But we are being born. There's a work going on in us right now. A process of being born. And then we shall be birthed. There is a birth coming yet. There are some who, now that's one of my pages notes, and I'm going to quit there. I'll give you the other page later. Praise the Lord. We've had brothers who said, well, you haven't been born again because the Bible says, Peter said, being born. That means we're in the process of being born. Well, that verse in Peter does not say that. That verse in Peter, uh, in the Greek and the other translations and, and the very meaning of it is being born again means that we have been born again. And that's what it says in some of the translations. We have been born again. But they try to use that for saying that we are being born again. Well, I believe we're being born again. But 
if I was a scholar and I did not believe that and somebody's trying to prove that to me from a scripture that I knew didn't say that, then I would, it would completely turn me off. And I talked to the brothers that were trying to prove that we're being born again by that scripture. I said, being born again is a good thing. Wonderful. But don't try to prove by that scripture. Otherwise, you'll cut people's ears off. You'll, you'll turn them away from the truth. There is a truth. We are being born again. He does deliver us now. He is delivering us right now. But we shall yet be delivered. We, are, we shall yet be birthed into something you have not seen yet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I thought I'd give you that little lesson. We'll go into the chapter 2 and the seven churches in the future. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning and all that's happened, your blessings in many ways. And I pray, God, that you will just let this word reveal to us, Lord, the greatness of of this Son of Man, standing in the midst of the candlesticks, and the greatness of that which he's bringing forth. Oh God, we, we want you to help us to see the church, the church that is your bride, the church, Lord, that is your bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh, the church which is your body. Help us to see it in its purity, and its power that you have designed for us, that it might set a goal before us to guide our lives and inspire us and motivate us to be what you want us to be, what you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thank you for listening. We pray you were blessed by this message. For written materials or to leave an offering, please visit billbrittonministries.com.